In this video, we're going to introduce the empirical formula. Now, in the previous video, I mentioned that there are two ways that two main ways that you can classify a molecule. One was by classifying the contributions of each atom to the mass. And that's what we looked at in the previous video was the mass percent giving the contribution of each atom to the total mass of the molecule. And the other one is just purely its composition. How many hydrogen atoms are there? How many oxygen atoms? How many carbon atoms, et cetera, right? So um, one of the ways to get there, the first thing that you want to establish when you're doing some sort of elemental analysis on a compound, the first thing you want to establish is the ratio of each uh, atom to one another. Is there a two to one ratio of carbons to hydrogens? A three to one ratio of hydrogens to oxygens? And that's, where the, that's what the empirical formula conveys. So the empirical formula is going to look exactly like the molecular, the way we write molecular formulas, but it's conveying very different information. So it's giving you the smallest whole number ratio between each of the atoms in a molecule. So the empirical formula gives you the smallest whole number ratio between the atoms in a molecule. Right, and like I said, this is typically the first stop shop, the first place you're going to go in order to determine the molecular formula for a compound. The first thing you want to establish is the ratio of, these, of each of these constituents in the molecule. So, for example, there's a molecule, cyclohexane, that has the molecular formula C6H12. Right, so this is the molecular formula for cyclohexane. So that means that to form this molecule, you'll need six carbons and 12 hydrogens. What you'll notice is that since there's this, um, that you'll notice that there's a ratio between carbons and hydrogens that's two to one, right? Since there's 12 hydrogens for six, for every six carbons. So this being the molecular formula, we can deduce the empirical formula from it, right? Since the empirical formula is just giving you the whole number ratio, the smallest whole number ratio, this would be like reducing a fraction, right? So uh, the empirical formula would just be CH2, right? So this is the empirical formula. Right, so CH2 would be your empirical formula, and what this is conveying to you, like I said, it looks exactly like a molecular formula, but it's conveying different information. This is telling you that there is a two to one ratio between the hydrogens and the carbons, right? So it's not saying this is the molecule, right? It's saying this is the, the ratio of hydrogens to carbon uh, for a given molecule. Right. So if we take an example of an empirical formula, right? So let's say we had the empirical formula CH5N. Right? Let's say this is our empirical formula. This could lead to different molecular formulas. Let's say we multiply these guys by two. Right? So if you multiply by two, you get the molecular formula C2H10N2. Right, if you multiply by three, right, let's say we multiply by three, then that will give us C3, H15, N3, right? But they're all stemming from this same empirical formula. So determining that empirical formula from elemental analysis, uh, some sort of experimental data, will uh, be your first step in determining the molecular formula. Now, in the next video, we'll talk about how we go from an empirical formula to a molecular formula. But in this video, what I really wanted to do is just first introduce the concept of the empirical formula and go through a few examples of how we calculate the empirical formula from experimental data. So this is the first example that I wanted to look at. Um, and this problem says a compound is analyzed and found to contain 79.8 grams of carbon and 20.2 grams of 
of hydrogen determine its empirical formula, right? So this data, this 79.8 grams of carbon, 20.2 grams of hydrogen, that's coming from elemental analysis data, right? Uh, one way you could do this uh, for hydrocarbons is put it through a combustion reaction, right? And you'll be able to tell how much carbon and how much hydrogen uh, is in that compound. It'll give you these total masses and then it's up to you to establish that ratio. But luckily we can do this, but we have to be able to compare these carbons and hydrogens on an equal footing, right? Because we know that 20.2 grams of hydrogen, right? Um, you know, that could be a very different amount from 20 grams of carbon, right? These have different atomic masses. So we have to put them on an equal playing field for comparison. This is where the concept of the mole is very important, right? What we're going to do is convert both of these guys to moles. Then we can directly compare their mole to mole ratio, right? With, with the weights, we can't do that because, you know, one gram of carbon is not equal to one gram of, of hydrogen. But we do know that one mole of carbon is the same as one mole of hydrogen, right? It's the same number of carbon and hydrogen atoms. So it gives us an equal footing, uh, equal footing for comparison. So let's let's do the first part. So first, I want to just convert both of these guys uh, to moles. So we have seventy nine point eight grams of carbon, and if we look on the periodic table, the molar mass for carbon for every one mole of carbon, there's going to be twelve grams of carbon, right? Just getting this information from the periodic table. So that means in this sample, right, from this analysis, we have 6.65 moles of carbon. All right, now let's do the exact same thing uh, for the hydrogen that's present, right? So we have 20.2 grams of hydrogen and from the periodic table, we know that for every one mole of hydrogen, there's one mole, one gram of hydrogen, right? So this gives us 20.2 moles of hydrogen. Okay, so now we know how many moles of each atom we have present in this molecule, right? Now, in order to establish the molecular formula, the empirical formula, we have to establish a ratio between carbons and hydrogens, which now that they're both in moles, we can do that, right? So what you want to do here in order to establish the empirical formula, you want to divide the number of moles of all of the atoms by the smallest, uh, the one with the smallest number of moles present in the compound. So in this, in this case, it would be carbon. Right? We have 6.65 moles of carbon, so we're going to uh, divide both of these by 6.65 to establish a relative ratio. So first we'll do this for carbon. Right, Obviously it's going to be 1, but just for completeness sake. 6.65 moles of carbon. We're going to divide that by the smallest number here, which is 6.65. Right, so that means you're gonna have a one-to-one -one ratio here for carbon, right? Which is exactly what we want by dividing by the smallest number. And then when we do the same thing for hydrogen, right? So we'll have 20.2 moles of hydrogen over 6.65 moles. Right, and so if you uh, divide these, you will get 3.0. So you'll get three for hydrogen, right? So now we've established from the data, com by converting these two to moles, we've established that in this compound, there is a three to one ratio between hydrogen and carbon. And that's all that the empirical formula is telling us, right? So we know that from this ratio that we've established, right? For every one carbon, there's three hydrogens. That's going to give us an empirical formula of CH3, right? This is going to be our empirical formula. Right, and we just get this 
from uh, from the experimental data, establish the ratios, and then once we get those ratios, we have all the information we need for the empirical formula. Now, like I said, the main thing I want to stress here is is how useful having this dimension of the mole is to even establishing this, right? We, we can't compare the weights directly, right? Because these guys don't have the same atomic masses, but when we put them in the dimension of moles, now we can make an even comparison to establish the ratio in terms of composition, right? Okay, so let's look at a different problem. This one's going to be a little bit more involved because um, we're getting the data from mass percents. You're not necessarily given the total mass like you were in the last problem. You're given the mass percents. So in this problem, it says an unknown compound contains only carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Elemental analysis reveals that the compound is 38.7% carbon and 9.75% hydrogen by mass. What is the empirical formula for this unknown compound, right? So we're, we're given the mass percentages from elemental analysis, right? So we know that by mass, uh, this compound is 38.7% carbon, 9.75% oxygen, 9.75% uh, hydrogen. So the next thing that, the first thing that we want to do here is establish what is the mass percent of oxygen. And that's actually pretty easy to calculate because we know that in total we have to have 100%, right? The composition has to equal up to 100%. So all we have to do to solve for the mass percent of hydrogen is just take 100% minus the percentages that we have here, the sum of the percentages that we have here. So we have 38.7% plus 9.75% Right, so that means we have a percentage for oxygen of 51.55%. So this compound by mass is 51.55% uh, oxygen. Right, so now we have all of the mass percentages. So what do we do from here? Well, we can proceed in a very similar way as we did in the last problem, except we have to assume some sort of total mass, right? Um, and in order to make the math, the math easier, we're going to just assume 100 grams. So your first step in, in this, or what I would suggest, you can assume any mass you want, but to make the math easier, what we're going to do is assume we have 100 grams of total compound. Right. So how does this make the math easier? You might be asking. Well, it makes the math easier because if we assume 100 grams of compound, that means that in 100 grams of compound, we'll have 51.55 grams of oxygen. We'll have 38.7 grams of carbon and we'll have 9.75 grams of hydrogen, right? So that basically, that gives us the masses that will be present in a 100 gram sample. And it's easy to calculate because we are working from 100% anyway. So then your percentages just directly become your masses in this case. So now we can proceed in a very similar way as we did in the last problem. Now we know how much of each element we would have in a 100 gram sample. We can proceed in a very similar manner that we did in the last problem. So uh, starting with our oxygen, right? So we have 51.55 grams of oxygen. From the periodic table, we know that for every one mole of oxygen, we have 16 grams of oxygen, right? So when you do the math, that gives us 3.22 moles of oxygen. Next up, let's do the carbon. So we have 38.7 grams of carbon present in a 100 gram sample. For every one mole of carbon, we'll have 12 grams of carbon. And so that's going to also equal 3.22 moles for the carbon. Now let's do hydrogen. We know that we have 9.75 grams of hydrogen in a 100 gram sample, for every one mole of hydrogen, we have 
one gram of hydrogen from the periodic table. And so that's going to give us 9.75 moles of hydrogen, right? Okay, so in this scenario, right, we have three atoms that make up this entire molecule, right? So we're going to have to, again, proceed in the same way we did in the last problem and take the smallest one. So the smallest one in this case is 3.22, the smallest number of moles. So we'll just take each one of those and divide them by 3.22. So we have 3.22 moles of oxygen divided by 3.22 moles. That's obviously going to give us one for oxygen. And for carbon, 3.22 moles of carbon over 3.22 moles. That's going to give us, again, one for carbon. And then for hydrogen, 9.75 moles of hydrogen over 3.22 moles. That's going to give you three. Now, it's not exactly three. It's going to be like 3.01, 3.00 something. Uh, but if you have something that is that close to a whole number, you can go ahead and round uh, down or up to your closest whole number. So this establishes the ratio between all of the atoms that are present in this molecule. So we have everything we need to write our final empirical formula. So our empirical formula in this case would be C h3 o right just going off of our established ratios between each atom three hydrogens for every one carbon and every one oxygen that gives us an empirical formula of ch3 o okay so those are a few examples of how to calculate the empirical formula from experimental data what i want to do in the next video is show you how to take this empirical formula and use it to determine the molecular formula for a compound. Like I said initially, this empirical formula is really just a stepping stone to get to the molecular formula that we're oftentimes really interested in.